get started tonight. Um, welcome again, everybody, to the Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium uh, for our, our fourth installment here. Uh, I'm Michael Ivan. I'm one of the neurosurgeons here at University of Miami, uh, and I'm joined today by my co-directors, Dr. Komatar and Dr. Morcos, uh, both brain tumor and, uh, specialists, and Dr. Uh, Morcos, the chairman of our department. Uh, thank you all for being here. Just a couple of quick uh, notes for tonight's symposium. If you have any questions, you could always visit our Twitter at Brain Miami. Uh, the lecture will be recorded and then put, put on YouTube afterwards. Um, you could search that, uh, or you could go to our uh, departmental website for a link to that. Uh, we also have information on our uh, departmental Twitter and Instagram or mine, which you could follow for uh, more details on upcoming symposiums. Uh, and that brings us to uh, another special announcement. Tomorrow we have our first uh, cerebrovascular and skull, skull based symposium uh, brought to you by Dr. Morcos. Uh, he has two veteran uh, special guests, uh, Dr. Spessler and Dr. Barrow. We'll be talking about anterior and posterior aneurysms. Uh, there's a great uh, list of panelists there and also our vascular and skull based team will be joining as well for the discussion. Uh, very excited for the first meeting tomorrow night, same time, um, but a different Zoom link. Also a quick teaser for next week on our Brain Tumor Symposium, we'll be uh, welcoming Dr. Lim, who is a professor at John Hopkins and the new chairman for Stanford uh, Neurosurgery, who will be talking on immunotherapy for brain tumors. Uh, so let's get to this week. Uh, we have a great list of panelists, uh, literally from coast to coast. Uh, we have Dr. Tate, who is an assistant professor uh, and my uh, senior resident uh, or chief from UCSF, who's now at Northwestern. The brain tumor and mapping specialist, Dr. McCann, who is uh, associate professor um, and director of awake brain mapping for tumors and epilepsy at Columbia New York Presbyterian. We have Dr. Harvey Jumper, who's an associate professor of neurosurgery and a brain tumor specialist at UCSF. He's also the co-director of the Sherry Sobrato Brisson Brain Cancer Survivorship Program. Uh, Dr. Ganesh Rao, professor of neurosurgery and brain tumor specialist, uh, joining us from uh, UT MD Anderson. He's also the program director at Baylor uh, and past president of the CNS. Um, and we have Randy D'Amico coming from us from New York, uh, director of neurosurgery service at Wyckoff um, and neurosurgery at Northwell Health in Lenox Hill. Thank you all uh, for joining us from all over the country this evening. Tonight's guest, we really have someone special. Uh, Hugh DeVoe is, is joining us for a late night symposium. I think it's 11 p.m. over there in France. He is a professor and chairman of neurosurgery uh, at Montpellier uh, University, and also the head of the INSERM team, which is a team that focuses on plasticity of the central nervous system and human stem cells and glial tumors at the Institute of Neurosciences in France. Uh, I think we all know him as an expert in awake cognitive neurosurgery, especially with gliomas. And uh, over his 20 year history of dealing with this uh, pathology, he developed uh, this novel fundamental approach, which is centered on brain connectomics and neuroplasticity rather just on traditional um, kind of functions which are locally identified. Uh, his four books here are, are, are shown on this slide. He also has more than 340 publications. Uh, many of them are, are extreme, are, I mean, they're all extremely impressive, but uh, you know, including in Nature and, and, and great journals. Uh, I won't go through the long list of awards and journal and um, positions that he has. Uh, it's, it's very uh, impressive. But we're, we're so lucky to have him join us from France here late night to, to talk to our, our global community and tell us on his approach on how he does glioma surgery. So Dr. Fo, thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to uh, show um, my results regarding surgery for the gray glioma, but uh, also to uh, introduce the new concept of a meta network and I will insist a little bit about uh, uh, this uh, new theory uh, at the end of uh, this talk and to show, of course, uh, the implication for surgery of the brain uh, and especially in your oncology. Very quickly, of course, the introduction is like, uh, is based on the fact that uh, now uh, for 20 years, uh, we demonstrated that uh, it's possible. You share your slides, Dr. Phil, that'd be great. Thank you. And you know, definitely now it's possible to increase the survival of patients with brain tumors, especially low grade glioma, but also the quality of life. And uh, uh, the goal is really to be ambitious uh, and it's possible by doing surgery earlier and earlier. So the goal we will see is to try to discover uh, this kind of tumor um, when patient 
just started to, to have some symptoms or even uh, in uh, uh, the frame of uh, uh, screening uh, in incident and discovery of uh, low grade glioma. The second goal just, is really... Uh, we, we still can't see the slides, Dr. Defoe, one more second. Sorry about that. So I said that uh, uh, it's possible to be ambitious because uh, we did surgery earlier and earlier, but also the goal was to increase the extent of resection. And uh, we will introduce uh, the concept of uh, supratotal resection, which is possible only if we can preserve the quality of life of patients. So this is the reason why also we introduced the concept, the concept of uh, functional based resection and uh, you will see that uh, in my operating theater, I have not so much the habit to use technology, but much more to weigh the patient and to better understand the connectome of this patient at that time, and then to introduce the concept of meta-network. Very quickly, natural history of the disease. Uh, I think that everyone now um, really agrees with the fact that uh, the gray glioma is not stable, that it will become malignant after regular growth, and that we have to do something before that the tumor is malignant, but also before that patient starts to have uh, uh, too many symptoms. And uh, to do that, uh, I will continue to say that we have to be more objective by doing your psychological examination before and after each treatment, which is true for surgery, but also for chemotherapy and radiotherapy. It's too easy to say that patient is well uh, just because we met him for uh, 10 minutes and the patient is able to move and to talk. It's not enough. So please, take the habit to do cognitive assessment and you will see that in more than 80 to 90 percent cases, even today, uh, some patients refer to our departments with a normal life, in fact, at attentional processing disorders, executive function disorders, and so on. And more and more, you will see that we introduce the concept of the mentalizing personality assessment because uh, uh, French people most of the time would like to enjoy perfect normal life and are very demanding. We understood that uh, when patient had some deficit before any treatment and uh, um, enjoyed a normal life according to social and uh, professional activities, in fact, the deficit we can identify thanks to the preoperative cognitive assessment is not related to the location of the tumor, but to the invasion by the tumor of the connectivity. So it's very important for young surgeons to understand the principle of the connectome and to know the functional anatomy of the Y matter tract. Because more you have an infiltration of this connectivity, more the patient will have a decline of cognitive function, and more you will have difficulties to remove the tumor with a perfect return to a normal life. And this is the reason why, finally, uh, the patient will have seizures despite uh, uh, um, sometimes uh, cognitive scores more or less uh, almost normal during the preoperative assessment. So very quickly regarding the oncological considerations, because I think that we start really to agree in the world, more the tumor is big before surgery, more you have a risk to see malignant transformation and then the overall survival uh, will not be so optimal. This is the reason why we have to arrive before, earlier. We have understood also that if a tumor is growing faster, then the prognosis is worse. So please try to save time to perform at least two MRIs for the gray glioma, at least suspected the gray glioma, before to go to your protein theater. And then by calculating the growth rate, which is very easy, you will see that you have a better prognosis than by using the Wu classification, whatever the past or the new Wu classification. And all patients in the world can understand that. If the tumor is growing slowly, then that means that we have more time to think about the strategy. If the tumor is growing faster, we have to arrive earlier. You will tell me, of course, uh, everyone knows that it's related to the molecular pattern. And I will answer no. You can have a tumor growing faster while the molecular pattern is good. 
And the reverse is true. We have many patients with IDH1 wild type with uh, slow growth before surgery, and we did an extensive resection, and we did no adjuvant treatment for that in surgery. And in 85% of cases, the natural history of the residue after surgery, despite the fact that it was a wild type, was in agreement with a classical indolent low-grade glioma. And this is the reason why we published last year the fact that the survival was more than 84% after seven years of follow-up following surgery without any adjuvant treatment. So that means that 85% of patients will have a stoop after surgery based on the molecular profile for nothing. And of course, they will have cognitive disorders after five years. And if you do an objective neuropsychological assessment, not only before surgery, but five years later, after radiotherapy, you will see that they have not a perfect quality of life just because we applied the protocol based on the Bible, which is the molecular profile. No. And now what about surgery, of course? Very quickly, of course, uh, you know these uh, uh, papers demonstrating that uh, if you do just a biopsy, the median survival is not good before between approximately six to seven years. But to be objective regarding the extent of resection, we have to calculate the volume before and after surgery. But in the vast majority of trial, which is the evidence-based medicine based uh, on the molecular biology, this kind of volumetric assessment is not done. So that means that in fact, we don't know what was done really into the OR because the surgeon will tell you, of course, in all cases, I removed the tumor. I do not believe on that if I cannot see the flare on the postoperative MRI with a volumetric assessment. And when you do that, suddenly the median survival is beyond 15 years without any problem regarding the quality of life. And it's true in France uh, regarding the series we published already six to seven years ago in our low grade glioma network about more than uh, now 2000 patients, but it's true in my own experience. The second point is that more and more, because patients still alive, because we avoid myelinant transformation, because they enjoy more life, but because we cannot cure this kind of tumor, then we will have to reoperate a second time, a third time, and we have to preserve the quality of life also, thanks to mechanisms of neuroplasticity. So, by balancing this knowledge of the connectome of this patient at that time and the fact that we know that the tumor will continue to migrate, we have to treat earlier, but also to retreat regularly, in my experience, approximately every four to five years. Of course, we have to adapt to each patient. So there is no reason to do biopsy anymore because you have also a risk of undercotation. Nonetheless, patient I operated on yesterday was referred by another department, and it seemed that it was impossible to remove the tumor, and they did a biopsy just to check if it was a tumor. Of course, I knew by looking at the first MRI that it was not a stroke. So this patient had biopsy for nothing. So I will continue to claim that we have not to do biopsy except in gliomatosis like. So the question is why we do not perform extensive maximal early resection in 100% cases of patients with suspected low-grade glioma? And the answer is we are afraid by the brain because most of the time these patients are young, they are well, and we don't want to induce any severe permanent deficit. So we have to know the brain because these tumors are classically located within the so-called eloquent areas. I don't know what it means, because you will see that in the meta-networking theory of brain functions, there is no one area corresponding to one function. And I will insist about that in the last part of the talk, because we published this paper yesterday in the Physiological Reviews, which is the Bible of the human physiology. Localizationism now is really, mm, mm, should disappear. 
So this is the reason why we participated uh, for 20 years, uh, not only in surgery for uh, low-grade glioma patients, high-grade glioma and other kind of uh, brain surgery, but also in uh, uh, proposing new model of uh, connectionism because we can see the truth into the operating theater every day uh, and by uh, doing cognitive assessment online in the wake patient, but also in property mapping. This is good for the patient because they will live longer and better. This is good for us because we better understand the brain and definitely we can predict before surgery what is possible without taking any risk, except in one person cases, the risk zero does not exist, of course, but we have more than 99% of reliability. Of course, uh, we have to use a functional imaging before surgery, but it's good in order to do a pre-planning in this patient, but not to think that this is the absolute truth. I am PhD in cognitive neuroscience, in functional imaging, and I know that this is not reliable. And I will continue to claim that the sensitivity and specificity is not enough in order to make any decision and especially to use it into a neural navigation system during surgery, except if you don't want to do supratotorization. And of course, you will leave a margin around by Italy. I use the fMRI and finally my patients are well too. Yes, but I would like to see the median survival after 20 years. And of course, if your patients are too well, that means that you leave, you left too much tumor. And why? Because we would like to believe on fMRI. And because I am PhD in this field, of course, we tried to use resting state for many, many years and to um, make uh, some correlation with intraoperative electrical mapping. And this is a beautiful tool to better understand the meta networking brain processing. But in 2 or the reliability is around 85%, which is beautiful, but I cannot tolerate to have 15% of risk to induce a permanent deficit or not to remove enough tumor because we know that the extantarization is directly correlated to it, the survival independently of the molecular biology. Same thing for DTI. We would like to believe on the fact that this is the function while we know that it's not the anatomy, but just movement of molecular water, molecular water. Everyone knows that, but nonetheless, we continue to use it. So we are asked to people uh, involved in this field to validate the DTI in many recent papers. And as you know, they say by themselves, not in surgeons, but uh, um, um, real expert in the field in the world today that the tractogram contain many more invalid than valid bundles. So this is not the function and this is invalid in the vast majority of cases. So this is beautiful for research, but how do you want to use it in order to say, I will stop into the OR according to the DTI uh, pre-planning. That means that we are lost in the brain. So to avoid that, please weigh the patient because you have the brain in front of you and not just, and you will show in the end, this area stimulated by this probe at that time corresponding to this function. No, this is a localizationist view and definitely localizationism should be burned because never it existed. Fortunately for us and for our patient, this is the reason why we can remove very extensive part of the brain and to come back five years, 10 years later, and they continue to enjoy a perfect normal life with normal cognitive scores. Because we can do into the or anatomical functional correlation online independently of the technology, which is just a part of the history, but not the absolute truth while the cognitive assessment in real time is the absolute truth in a sense. So we adapted to the job, the hobby, the habits and leisures of patients and so on and so on. So that means that because we uh, have the habit to, to recruit many patients coming from five continents, we have to adapt to language, to the culture and so on. And of course, patients do not want exactly the same thing. They want to live longer and better, okay? But better 
is not exactly the same according to the philosophy, the culture, the religion, and uh, uh, the language also. So I will not insist today about the legal issues, the cultural aspect, uh, the socioeconomic parameters too, uh, which are not the same in France or in US, for instance, regarding the post-operative cognitive rehabilitation, which is absolutely crucial in order to increase the chance for the patient to recover completely, but also to come back five to ten years later, thanks to mechanisms of neuroplasticity induced by the immediate postoperative cognitive rehabilitation. In other um, uh, words, when you ask to the patient to be rehabilitated after your surgery, even if the patient is able to move and to talk, then you increase indirectly his median survival because you increase the chance to reoperate him or her and then to increase the extantarization the second or the third time so everything is linked this is the reason why i cannot understand why i continue to see so many papers with just a cortical mapping by uh, thinking that the cortex is the most important part of the brain of course we have to see many parts of the cortex interconnected but if you cut the cable, then you will not have the possibility to recover for the patient. So we have to understand this connectivity and to stop into the OR according to the connectome, namely the Y matter tracts, and of course their cortical termination in order to have a look into the whole cortical subcortical network, but also the interactions between networks and not just one area corresponding to one function. And maybe it will be uh, difficult to understand for younger people, but to use DTI, fMRI, microscope, ECOG, intraoperative neural navigation, and so on and so on, is a limitation for your own brain in order to understand what happened in front of you online during surgery, because the brain you have uh, uh, in front of you is much more complex than the technology can tell you in this patient at that time. But your brain connected to the brain of the patient, connected to the brain of the neuropsychologist, and connected to your knowledge of the functional anatomy and of the feedback provided by the intraoperative electrical mapping will give you so many information online giving you the opportunity to forget totally that Broca's area is the area of speech, for instance, which is totally wrong, fortunately for my patients, because I removed Broca's area in more than 300 of cases and never I induced any severe permanent deficit. But the problem in that, if I speak about Broca's area, you will tell me we have understood and we will do awake surgery in all cases in the left hemisphere. And so what? The right hemisphere is not important, you think, for you. When you are doing this kind of surgery, you need the whole brain and the interact, inter, interactions between such networks in order to create your behavior. So that means that in the right non-dominant hemisphere, you have networks and not just areas involved in spatial cognition, social cognition. What we are doing today is much more complex for me because I have not you in front of me, but just a screen. So that means that I have some problems of mentalizing and behavior according to the fact that technology is a limitation for my creativity in front of you. So you see that by telling that, I need both hemispheres, like my patients. If it's true for me, it's true for them. So we developed new tasks into the operating theater in order to have a real insight into be able to do two things simultaneously, multitasking, able to preserve the cognition, able to understand not only what uh, someone is telling in front of you using language, but also the nonverbal communication and so on and so on. And of course, also the emotional processing. So how do you want to say into the right hemisphere, I will do that under general anesthesia and I will use EMEPs with neural navigation and I'm sure that my patient will not be hemiplegic following surgery. Of course, I'm sure about that. 
I did not induce any permanent hemiplegia for more than 10 years. But is it enough for my patient to return to normal life as a human being? And of course, the answer is no. So, first of all, we have to understand that in the left so-called dominant hemisphere, Broca's era does not exist. We have to understand that, that sometimes it's much more important to ask to the patient to do a specific task for spatial cognition in the so-called right non-dominant hemisphere if he would like to preserve the ability to dance. Today, I have met a patient I operated on twice. The first time was 15 years ago. The second time was seven years ago. No chemo, no radiotherapy. I'm sorry, it's not one uh, and I need to could delete it. The patient is perfect, enjoying normal life, but she told me, I tried to dance and I loved that before surgery and now I have some problems. And I can understand that but because it was in the so-called SMA area in the right non-dominant hemisphere. And of course the patient is still alive with 15 years of follow-up and no chemo, no radiotherapy and normal life. But she was not perfect. And of course I understood the mechanisms. And I say to the patient, I'm sorry about that because 15 years ago, I was not aware about the fact that the SMA could be removed, but with some consequence. And now I know. So I can give the choice to the patient. And this is exactly the same thing for cognitive function, but also for emotional processing. So frequently, we induce modification of the personality of the patient. You know what? Now I have the results about that. And they are not so good. And it's so complex for this paper today to be accepted because it's politically incorrect to say, I have a so good results, no hemiplegia, the patients are living longer, but I changed their personality. And no one would like to publish this kind of results. So, your surgeon is afraid by the truth. Don't be afraid. And to do that, the best way is to understand the connectivity and not only the pyramidal pathways. Of course, we have not to cut the corticospinal tract, but is it enough? If the patient is a, a sportman, if the patient is a surgeon, if the patient is a pianist, they would like to preserve this high level of integration regarding the movement. And we know now that we have to preserve the negative motor area, and we published in brain past year the cortical area, but also the subcortical pathway, the frontostriatum tract. And this is exactly what I cut 15 years ago. In this patient, we now have some difficulties for many years, of course, for surgery to dance. You will tell me maybe it's not absolutely crucial, crucial to dance. I don't know, I have not to decide for them because if they are telling me I want absolutely to dance, I can leave a small amount posteriorly today of residue at the level of the FST and to be sure that the patient will return to a perfect normal life according to his wishes. So we have just to afford the choice. You will tell me they will not live so longer. Of course they will, because we will endure plasticity and I will come back five to 10 years later. And it's exactly what we did. And we have understood that movement is not only, of course, uh, motor execution, but also somatosensory feedback. Everyone knows that but it's not enough. It's not just somatosensory perception, but also awareness of body shame. We published that in brain past year also because I have induced some modification of the awareness of the body shame in so many patients by doing this kind of resection. And some of them are totally happy with that because they are not aware of that. And some are not happy because they have a higher level of meta cognition, to be aware of the fact that you have some deficit or not. Visual field, I will not insist, but uh, definitely in France and in the vast majority of countries in Europe, uh, you cannot drive, so you cannot have a normal life if you have an EMI anopia. So we have to discuss about that with the patient. You will tell me DTI is not. No. DTI will allow you to avoid amyanopia in approximately 90 to 95% of cases. We can avoid in 99% of cases by doing awake surgery because we are not just mapping and monitoring the vision field, 
but also the spatial awareness. For instance, the ability to do a line bisection. Why to do that? To avoid any neglect. Otherwise, you cannot drive. I have not to decide if the patient in front of me 30 years ago can continue to drive or not because the most important is the survival. We can do both because it will have rehabilitation, I will come back. For language, I'm sure you know that we have a dorsal pathway with uh, involvement uh, of the lateral part of the superior longitudinal fascicle in uh, 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 the articulatory processing and the arcuate fascicle in uh, uh, the conduction aphasia. I say that thousands of times in my life. 90% of neurosurgeons I meet now in this period continue to believe on the fact that the pars opercularis, so the Broca's area, is directly connected to the Wernicke's area, while in fact it's connected to the posterior part of T2 and T3. It has been reported many times in the field of neuroscience for 15 years. The vast majority of neurosurgeons I know are not aware about that. How do you want that they're able to operate in this left dominant hemisphere. They don't know that uh, the inferior frontal occipital fascicle is involved not only in verbal, but also in non-verbal semantic processing, which is the most important part of uh, understanding in our daily life. Most of the time we are not speaking, so we have to preserve it. They don't know that when you cut the anterior part of the ILF, the inferior longitudinal fascicle, you will increase the reaction time in order to have a lexical access. You can live with that, but maybe this patient would like to preserve it because he has to give talk regularly in his life. So for him, maybe it's crucial. You have to give a choice and to know if you will preserve or not part of the ILF during surgery. But we have to understand also that if you cut the ILF and the incinate, you will have some degrees of compensation by the inferior frontal occipital fascicle, which is not just constituted by one or two pathways, but at least seven layers. And I'm sure that we will continue to discover new layers in the next years, because this is the most important fasciculus in human being. So that means that now we open the door for real plasticity, not one area able to compensate another cortical area, but a network able to compensate another network. And of course, the next step will be to induce the fourth dimension by telling that interactions between sub networks could be compensated by different interactions between different sub networks in order finally to give the opportunity for the patient to recover despite a more extensive resection, not against his quality of life. Speaking about the I4, I told you that it was absolutely crucial in order to understand at the supramodal level, not just language. When you stimulate, a patient can be able to give you a good name, but not able to understand how to do a semantic association task. For instance, gloves with, of course, hands and not feet. And the patient can tell you gloves and feet. So that means that he's able to show you, to move, to speak, to name, everything is okay, but he understands nothing. And it's true, even when you stimulate the i at least the deep layer in the so-called right non-dominant hemisphere. That means that the day later, you will go to meet the patient in front of the family by telling, who are you? He will tell you, I feel well. And you say, mm, okay, no problem. Why to do wake surgery and to preserve the iPhone? My patient is able to talk and to, and, and to move, but he will not return to a normal professional life in at least 30% of cases, at least full time. And this is true for the emotional processing. We are human beings. So that, that means that first of all, we are emotion. And now it's possible for many years to introduce new tasks into the OR and to say to a patient, I will preserve your behavior and your personality. And not enough because we would like to publish uh, our paper by telling, I'm sorry, but I did not succeed in 100% cases and many patients changed a little bit their personality. And once again, it's not politically correct, but this is the truth. Why? Because initially I did not understand that 
by cutting the lateral part of the right inferior frontal occipital fascicle in the right handed patients, I induce some change, changes regarding the mentalizing process. Low level perception of emotion of others, high level inference of intentions of others. So exactly what I cannot do in front of my screen, but what I can do in front of a patient. So we started to model the connectivity of the right non-dominant hemisphere. And you can see that uh, this is in fact a, a very basic model taking into account uh, the nonverbal semantics, the emotional processing, the higher cognitive function multitasking, and so on and so on. How do you want to operate a patient under general anesthesia by telling, I'm sure he will recover, except he will not be hemiplegic. So it depends on are you ambitious in order to give really them the opportunities to return to their normal life or not? So reasons, because we did that for more than 20 years. And as you have understood, of course, I did not introduce this kind of task since the beginning. Then, unfortunately, I have, like my colleagues in France, some deficit initially regarding the higher cognitive function and the behavioral processing. Nonetheless, more than 800 diffuse low grade glioma, more than 1,200 uh, uh, now wake surgery in so called inresectable areas, Broca's area, Wernicke's area, Rolandic area, and so on and so on. What happened? Mortality zero, but because most of them are young with no previous medical history of disease, but because they have a good team and good anesthesiologists, which is absolutely crucial. But 20 years later, fortunately, they also be able, they were able to learn like me, and then we increased our level of reliability. 0.5% of severe permanent deficit due to deep stroke, very rare, but it could happen. The zero does not exist, of course. But in 30% of cases, by doing this very extensive resection within so-called eloquent areas, according to a localization view, they improved thanks to postoperative rehabilitation, thanks to the preservation of the connectivity, and thanks to the fact that, of course, we re, re, re operate now three times, or sometimes after 20 years of fallout. And in 80% of cases, we block epilepsy. And if you remove more tumor and then more infiltration outside the core of the tumor, then you increase the chance to control epilepsy. And if there is no epilepsy, remember the fourth slide, then the mechanisms of neuroplasticity will increase again, then you can push this plasticity in order not only to preserve the quality of life, but to reoperate and then to increase the median survival. So in fact, it's strange, maybe, but more you remove, more the patient will live longer and better if you preserve the connectome of this patient at that time. And of course, I will not insist about the meta-analysis we did with Mitch many years ago, but that means that if we can do that in many uh, departments of neurosurgery, like uh, today in uh, Chicago, San Francisco, Miami, Montpellier, you can do that everywhere in the world. So it should be now the standard. But now we have to push more because I started to have uh, more than 20 years of follow-up and I have more and more problems because many patients still alive, they are well, and I start to feel a little bit uncomfortable because the tumor will continue nonetheless to grow, to migrate, and the question is what we can do. And fortunately, the brain is there in order to help us by pushing this plasticity. And some old slides, we understood the mechanisms of composition of the SMS and room. And in fact, I told you today, no, they do not completely compensate. It depends on what they would like to preserve for their quality of life. If they want to dance with this kind of recovery, in fact, they have not a normal life. Now I'm aware about that. I was not aware about that 15 years ago. But you can push regarding also the primary motor cortex by doing reoperation a few years later after you have understood postoperative cognitive rehabilitation, which should be done systematically. But the problem is the reimbursement in many countries. So you see that the socioeconomical issues are really very important 
because for some patients, I can say in France, you will be rehabilitated because you have nothing to pay. And for some patients coming from North Africa, they will tell me I cannot. So I know that unfortunately, the level of recovery will not be the same. So I could be tempted to stop a little bit earlier in order to preserve the quality of life according to the discussion we had with the patient and the family before surgery, but according to the country also of the patient. You see that everything is linked. Recently, we published paper, finally not so uh, uh, many information about that in the literature before and after surgery regarding modification of the connectomics uh, in patients uh, with surgery within the so-called um, language area and with uh, uh, recovery of uh, language and especially naming tasks. And you can see that uh, there was a balance which was modified between both hemispheres regarding the network of naming in these cases. So that means that we can start to predict that before to go to the OR according to the preoperative functional imaging, which is helpful not to tell you this is the area of language you can forget, but to tell you before surgery, the patient started to compensate thanks to a modification of his connectome and not just by telling right, left, but by telling the pattern is much more complex and then you can push more the resection or not. And it's exactly what we applied uh, to come back. Uh, uh, you see, sometimes I have a not beautiful postoperative MRI because the patient is well, but I hate to do this. And I came back uh, 10 years later and I removed the so called Wernicke's area by preserving the connectivity we have seen. That's true for broker's area. Sometimes uh, the parsopercularis can tell you when you stimulate it, don't remove me because I'm still helpful for this patient at that time. But when you come back after cognitive rehabilitation and without, of course, radiotherapy, which otherwise will destroy this mechanism of, of re, uh, um, plasticity, then you will come back and you will remove more. And this is true for the frontal lobe. And I can tell you that all these patients benefited from five hours of cognitive assessment, behavioral assessment, and so on, and enjoy a normal life. But they can change a little bit their personality. For instance, this patient was more irritable following surgery. You will tell me we don't care. No, we have to ask to his wife. And the wife was not so happy with that. While the patient is able to move, to speak, to drive, no seizures, to work, but finally is not totally himself. We have to take care of this kind of information and then to give the choice to the patient because this is not against the median survival because now we went beyond 16 years of follow-up and this is uh, of um, median survival. I mean, the follow-up is more than 24 years now. And we will continue this prospective collation of data because 25% of my patients are still alive uh, uh, alive with more than 20 years of follow-up. So why? Because we said, we know that there are tumor and science beyond what we can see on MRI. fMRI is not the truth. DTI is not function, but flare is not a tumor. It's just the, co the core of the tumor. If you can remove more, please do that. Are oh, you crazy? I'm not crazy. I'm doing that according to the functional boundaries. What means functional boundaries? What we have seen, movement, language, multitask, cognitive function, mentalizing, emotional behavior. It's too much. You will not remove enough. I will remove more. So you see, each time I try to say something in my past 20 years, I would like to introduce more tasks. People are telling me, you will not remove enough. This is the reverse. I did the supratotalization. When I did supratotalization, they told me you will induce modification of the behavior. So we have now to know exactly what we would like to achieve in front of the patient. And the answer is very clear. If you do supratotalization, rate of death after more than 10 to 15 years now, because I published this paper already four years ago, is zero. So maybe I cured some patients. And of course, it's too early to say that. But I know that in supratotalization, in all cases, they return to a normal life. Why? Because I arrived earlier. So if you arrive earlier, you have two philosophies. Oh, we cannot touch the brain, the patient enjoy a normal life because it's too dangerous. Or no, 
if the patient is really well before surgery, that means that mechanisms on your plasticity are so efficient that they will compensate the mistake I will do by doing a very extensive resection, despite uh, many tasks I can perform during surgery. So the brain will help me thanks to postoperative cognitive rehabilitation. And finally, more we will do extensive resection, more we will rehabilitate the patient, more they will improve even in incidental diffuse Legrade glioma. Oncologically speaking, some people will tell me also, you have not a bright patient with incidental discovery because you have time and you can follow them. Never the, uh, the tumor will become malignant suddenly in a patient without any symptom. Wrong, wrong. So many times you can identify a ready foci of malignant transformation within the tumor. Sometimes you can see a sudden transformation in glioblastoma. And at that time, Everyone would like to operate, and the patient was referred to me, I remember very well, but it was already a glioblastoma. So I did surgery, and of course the patient died three years later because it was a secondary glioblastoma. Well, I can tell you that I would have been able to do a real supratotorization since the beginning, and I'm sure that this patient will be still alive today. So, what about incidental diffuse Le Grey glioma? I did more than 100 patients and never induced any severe permanent deficit. Why? Because the plasticity was efficient before surgery and because I stopped according to the connectome of the patient. But we did so many supratotal resection, 30% in addition to 30% of complete resection. So 60 to 70% of no residue at all, at least visible on MRI. So that means that, of course, we change radically natural history of the disease, despite the fact that you can see that in 30% cases, there were already some foci of malignant transformation. We published recently a paper about this sub-series to see the return to the normal life, I mean, to be able to work or not. And in 95, 97% cases, they were able to work full time. So that means that it's so rare to induce really a modification of the um, uh, quality of life of the patient. And of course, you can see the extent of resection. And if you do supratotal resection, all patients are still alive. So this is the reason why we proposed the screening in front of the National Academy of Medicine. And we started more and more to operate patients with intentional discovery. But the secret is to conclude this minimal common brain, the connectivity. We published in brain an atlas in the MNI with the possibility to predict with more than 90% of reliability if a patient will recover following surgery, but also after stroke. Neurologists are not so interested about that. Why? Because it's dangerous also to know what you can really do in theory according to the knowledge of mechanisms of neuroplasticity. It's dangerous also for neuro-oncologists because they like to do a stoop if this is a wild type. And we have seen that finally in 80% of cases, at least in our series, but uh, I don't know why I would have a different brain tumors. I do just a more extensive resection, maybe. We did not perform any adjuvant treatment and they are still alive after seven years. So please, when you cannot cut the connectivity, do chemotherapy, you will see a shrinkage, you will reoperate, not by inducing plasticity in this case, thanks to cognitive rehabilitation in a sense, but thanks to chemotherapy. Because radiotherapy, will induce deficit related to the fact that if you do an extensive resection according to the functional boundaries, in essence, what they will irradiate is the minimal common brain and the connectivity. And you will tell me, don't worry, we have new methodology. It's not dangerous. This is totally wrong. Because if you irradiate the i of the arcuate, what we cannot remove, it's not me, but in recent literature, they are telling, finally, when we start to do DTI, not in two, of course, other uh, operating theater or for radiotherapies, but before and after radiotherapy, you see a modification of the structure. 
And finally, even the EORTC started to say, maybe we have to be careful about the 1P9EQ status and we have to defer radiotherapy in order to preserve the cognition. And I was not in the list of authors. And nonetheless, they are really writing like Dufault. So finally, 20 years later, we started to say, hey, if we burn the brain, it's not so good. Oh, really? It depends if you would like to give them the opportunity to enjoy normal life for the next 15 to 20 years. I'm not speaking about glioblastoma. We have not just to see the next three years. We have to think about two decades. And this is the reason why we decided to operate Reoperate, we reoperate, and if there is an invasion of the connectivity, the minimum common brain, if you cut it, you will induce permanent deficit, please do chemotherapy, whatever the molecular profile. And if you induce a shrinkage, you can re re reoperate, and patient will live longer. And finally, for radiotherapies, don't worry, you will irradiate my patients because now with 15 years of follow-up, more and more, I am the first to say this is the good timing to irradiate because you're still alive 15 years later with a normal life. Once again, it's not against the overall survival, prospective collection of data. Now, we published a paper recently in Neurology, just uh, uh, three months ago, politically incorrect, I had the regret to tell you that when you do an extensive resection in a patient with a slow growing tumor, of course, I'm not totally crazy if the tumor is growing very quickly before surgery, as we say, it's a glioblastoma like, we have to be careful. But when the tumor is growing slowly, this is the reason why it's important to have two MRIs before to go to the OR. Then even if you have in the middle of the tumor foci of glioblastoma, you have not to irradiate immediately. You can see five-year survival, 95%. You can see an example here. It's really a high-grade glioma. I did really a complete resection according to the MRI. Of course, I did not cure the patient. I did really a second surgery 15 years later with no chemo radiotherapy. And it was so exciting to see that in this case, it was a high-grade glioma in 2002. And it was a low-grade glioma in 2017, according to the new classification, without chemo radiotherapy. And I have many cases like this. So really to conclude about now the functional anatomy, we have to understand the interactions, not only between areas, Broca's Wernicke's if you want, not only between, between sub-networks, dorsal, ventral, semantic, uh, uh, phonological pathways, if you want. Not just between networks, language, and uh, movement, but between network of network. Now I'm doing an improvisation because to be honest, this is the first time I'm giving this kind of talk at home by uh, just looking at the screen. And in addition, of course, uh, I am not to insist on the fact that it's not my native language. You can imagine that I build a specific transitory meta network, network of network, in order to try to be successful in front of you today. So now to be more practical, we published recently in your image, the sole atlas of cortical, subcortical pathways critical for functions, so not like fMRI, uh, we don't know if it's uh, critical or not, we sure it's critical. About almost 2,000 simulation sites regarding 16 functional domains, 15 years of work. And now this atlas will be available in the MNI template, not in order to tell you into the OR, please stop, but in order for younger people to build your mental imagery like I have into the OR, in other words, I can see the pathways and the simulation is just to check if my view at that time in this location of the tumor and this patient was real, the, the real truth or not. And then this is the concept of physiological reviews that we published today. I mean, the interactions between different networks and not just some networks, for instance, when you are into the operating theater, you can ask to a patient to move and to speak simultaneously. And just by doing 
language and movement is not just one plus one, but you need working memory because the patient have to be focused every four seconds for two hours without any rest, sustained attention. So you recruit another network and so on and so on. And by doing that, when you stimulate, you will disrupt a meta network. So interaction between different networks. It's exactly what we're doing in the real life. You are uh, um, in front of the TV and you have just a visual somatosensory input, auditory input, and more or less you are doing nothing. You use uh, your uh, uh, deformed network and suddenly you have an alarm and suddenly you have to find what means. While it's not a verbal warning, you have to find the good uh, um, solution in order to solve the problem. You have to deal with your emotional problem at that time. So, so many networks interacting all together in order to find the good behavior at that time. And of course, it's transitory, but it could be permanent. And this is the principle of learning. And when you are into the OR, please forget definitely when you stimulate to think that because you put your probe at this level at that time and you had this kind of deficit, this is the area of uh, dysfunction. In fact, you are disrupting a meta network, explaining why, to take my previous example, a patient can continue to move, can continue to speak, but sometimes is not able to do both simultaneously. And you will say, my patient will not be aphasic, will not be hemiplegic, yes, but no multitasking anymore, so it will lose its job. So to conclude, talk to the brain. Forget the tumor. The tumor you have to know more before surgery by doing volumetric assessment, by doing a second MRI, by calculating the growth rate. More or less, you, do, you know everything about the tumor. And of course, you will incorporate also the molecular pattern following surgery. But this is just a part of the truth. But into the OR, what you have to see is the connectivity and the modification of the connectivity online. And this is the reason why sometimes so you are doing a stimulation cortically at just the beginning of surgery. And finally, in the end, the map changed and you can remove a little bit more. And you show sure about that because the patient is awake and you show sure about that because you did also the subcortical stimulation. So please don't use too much technology. Avoid to be addict about the brain lab system, metronic system, neural navigation, never they will give you this kind of information. They don't know what means meta network in brain, but this is the reality. And if you now listen to the patient before surgery in order to give him what he wants a la carte, then you will really give him the opportunity to continue to be, I'm sorry about this word, but happy despite a chronic disease, and more the patient will be motivated in his life, more he will live longer. I cannot yet demonstrate that, but I can tell you that at least intuitively after 25 years, that's true. So we will work with this personality network in order to treat really not a patient, I'm sorry about that, a human being and not a tumor anymore. Thank you very much. Hey Hugh, um, this is Rick. Um, great talk, and 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 I really appreciate the fact that you're so aggressive uh, with these tumors, and I totally agree. I uh, just wanted to ask: Are there any low grades at all that you observe? Any at all? Any location? Any age that you observe? When I know that I will not be able to cut the connectivity, I mean, uh, if you have, it's very exceptional but I have approximately 10 cases like this. So I mean uh, less than 1%. You have an invasion of one tract, the pyramidal tract, the I4, the arcuate. You do the volumetric assessment and finally just four to five. It was incidental discovery. You know nonetheless after a few years that the tumor is growing. This is a tumor. But if I do surgery, I will remove more or less nothing, or I will induce a permanent deficit. And because in these examples, the growth rate is very slow, finally, I prefer to wait and maybe to give one day chemotherapy after just a biopsy or a resection outside the minimal common brain if the tumor is growing to the cortex. 
or into the anterior perforating substance. They have two patients like this. So that means that it's really exceptional, or of course, uh, as I said, gliomatosis like uh, when you have a patient with uh, both hemispheres are already involved. I'm just doing a biopsy and we will give temozolomide first and we will see what will happen. But I have seen in my series, uh, according to the uh, many opinions I have uh, every day, I refused approximately in 15% of cases. So that means that 85% of cases deemed to be inoperable were in fact resectable. Right, Dr. Defoe, yeah, fantastic talk. Just a quick question. You know, do you check plasticity before you re-op on these patients? Do you confirm your, your notion that the plasticity has moved or do you do that all intraoperatively? Both. Initially, I did that uh, uh, only in 2DR uh, because I would like to remove more. And finally, because the patient in front of me five to 10 years later was still uh, okay, I said, I will try to reoperate. And I was totally honest by, uh, with the patient by telling the risk uh, to reoperate is to do that for more or less nothing, uh, just a biopsy. But now, thanks to fMRI, and of course, I say twice that I was PhD when I was younger in functional imaging. In fact, I believe on that. But before and after surgery, in order to demonstrate the modification of the connectivity, not only induced by the tumor before treatment, but also induced by the surgery itself and the rehabilitation, more and more we are doing that before and after rehabilitation. It's so impressive to see the modification of the connectome. So in other words, if a few years later, the growth rate was slow, there is no so much invasion of the uh, uh, deep connectivity. Otherwise, you know that you will remove more or less nothing. If the patient is well, thanks to, again, your cognitive assessment objectively, that means that this patient compensated. And now you are doing fMRI and you compare with the fMRI a few years before, and you can see modification of the connectome. I feel really uh, uh, comfortable to say to a patient, I can propose you to be a real priority then because I know that in more than 95% of cases now, I will confirm this modification of the map into the OR and I will remove more. You, um, it, it's Guy McCann. You know, you, you talk a lot about the ability of rehabilitation to help induce recovery and plasticity. So how do you specifically interact with your rehabilitation team to make sure that they're focusing on the aspects of recovery that you think the patient needs? Yes, everything is supervised by uh, uh, my speech therapist and uh, a neuropsychologist, but both of them are PhD in cognitive neuroscience. So we are doing this kind of modeling thanks to their knowledge also of the functional anatomy. So that means that they can say to younger uh, speech therapists do not rehabilitate according to the classical book uh, by telling it was uh, a tumor located within so-called broca's area, but according to the mechanisms we started to, to understand regarding the modification, the pattern of uh, um, um, changes in uh, uh, the connectivity. So that means that uh, my patients are also followed three months later by the speech therapist telling you have to change the rehabilitation or not. Second, the job itself, this is the reason why I insist too much, maybe too much, but it's important for the patient, but also for his brain. If you stimulate the brain, then the brain will continue to learn, especially if the patient is young and then learning his job and not a 60 year ago, a 60 year old by doing a, uh, the same thing uh, uh, for 20 years. So that means that more we put the patient, more they are motivated, more we do a specific rehabilitation tailored to our knowledge of the modification of the functional connectome, more it will return to a full-time employment, more it will continue to learn and more it will be possible to reoperate. And now what we would like is of course to model on that. So the fifth, dimension, if I can say, and not just in four, like a network of network, in order to make uh, this uh, information available for everyone. But to do that, we have to do longitudinal follow-up with, of course, the imaging, the functional imaging, the cognitive scores, and the feedback, subjective feedback provided by the patient also. 
Thank you so much. I wish the crowd could be applauding, but we've had a lot of great comments uh, thanking you for your talk tonight. Uh, we have a few minutes left, and I, I'd like to just kind of get to a couple of the cases. Uh, Ganesh, do you want to start maybe? If, uh, because I think some more of the questions will, will come out with the cases. Michael, can you share it? Can you show the slide? Yeah, great. Uh, sure. Hold on one second. So, Professor Defoe, thank you very much. I learned I learn so much every time I hear you speak, so I'm grateful to, to be part of this. Um, I think Michael's going to show a case. Actually, I'm embarrassed to tell, show you this case now because I didn't do this case awake, <laughs> but it's a right frontal uh, lesion in a young woman uh, presented with a very large lesion. Um, and she actually was skiing at the time, and then she had a seizure, lost consciousness, and then came back, came you know, down from the mountain and was transported to our hospital and then when she showed up she was neurologically intact and she had this very large right frontal lesion that you can see uh, involves the, um, the right frontal lobe crossing the corpus callosum to some extent um, and so I took her to surgery before we show you the post op films I just have you know I have basically three questions number one would, would you do this surgery awake um, number two how aggressive would you be chasing it across the corpus callosum um, and then I can tell you post-operatively this turned out to be, they called it an anaplastic astrocytoma, but that was based entirely on the MIB. The mitotic index was 10% or something. So that they called it anaplastic and she ended up getting radiation and chemotherapy. This was several years ago, more, more than a decade ago. Um, so before Michael shows the post-op films, would you have given her chemotherapy and radiation if you got a good resection? First, uh, I would have performed a, a preoperative cognitive assessment because I'm sure that the patient was not normal but had uh, some cognitive disorders. I can tell you attentional disorders because you have, uh, I don't know if I can show, you can see my mouse on the screen here? No. No? Uh, um, I can tell you that posteriorly you have uh, the frontal eye field with the oculomotor motor field. And this patient had attentional processing disorders because you have the anterior part of the SLF2. Because she had also some problems of working memory and multitasking. And maybe she was not aware about that. But in my ideal management, I have to take into consideration in order to so wake the patient and then to stop posteriorly according to the SLF the oculomotor uh, um, uh, pathway, laterally the inferior frontal occipital fascicle running uh, to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is not completely invaded as you can see on the sagittal slide. So this is the reason why probably the patient was able to compensate uh, uh, and to give the feeling that uh, she was well except these seizures. And of course, to remove completely the corpus callosum, because if you do a lobectomy, that means that in essence, you cut the connectivity on the right, allowing the communication with the left, because there is nothing more in the right. So that means that you can continue to push until at least the midline, but also until the contralateral ventricle. I have the habit to do that. Uh, uh, regularly, but not in the contralateral connectivity. Otherwise, uh, you will induce suddenly a decompensation of the mechanisms of your plasticity. And you can do that. So under general anesthesia at the end of surgery, my goal is not to remove, of course, a so big tumor under local anesthesia, but just to disconnect posteriorly in the depth and laterally, and then to remove the vast majority and just general anesthesia, because at that time, you know that that you will, you will remove is not functional anymore. Then finally, to answer your third question, the question will be to perform post-operative um, uh, chemo and or radiotherapy. It will depend first on the extent of resection, second on the um, 3D organization of the tumor. I mean, I have the habit to remove the uh, lobe in block. And then into the lab, they will tell me you have a foci of malignant transformation more or less everywhere, including into the uh, uh, corpus callosum. Of course, I will not remove in block the corpus callosum 
but I know it will be in the end, so you can uh, um, have a sample. And at that time, I will say, of course, we have to give a adjuvant treatment. Or just in the middle of the tumor, even with a focus of glioblastoma, but in the periphery, it was a low-grade glioma. And at that time, I will not treat. But I will do, of course, MRI every two months. If the patient agrees by telling you have two philosophies, to have an adjuvant treatment now, or to do post-operative cognitive rehabilitation, to induce an improvement of uh, your uh, cognition in comparison with the preoperative status, and eventually to come back once the patient will be better in order to remove more and to achieve a supratotorization during the second surgery just for preventive surgery. So that means this is the concept that with this very big tumor, if you come back after rehabilitation and without cryotherapy in the meantime, then you can finally transform a very big tumor in a second preventive surgery and to be in uh, the uh, ambitious goal in agreement with the aim we had uh, in the second slide. So you see that in fact, I cannot in fact answer to your question because my protocol is that I have no protocol. Perfect, thank you. I think we can skip to the next case or whoever's got another case. Yeah, Dr. Defoe, when you, when you talk about supermaximal resection, are you talking about uh, resection to the, you know, uh, be a certain distance beyond the flare for lovery gliomas or is it um, uh, just all the flare? What, what would you call that? No, no, beyond the flare, um, I don't know, I can uh, show you if you want an example uh, very quickly. You can, if I can share my screen. Sure, I think you just have way to do that. I will be to answer to you by showing just, just two slides. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yeah, it's coming up slowly. Uh -huh. not the good one. Okay, this is the good one. So a 20-year-old uh, psychiatrist, of course, it's a bias, but um, I have so many patients like this telling you, I would like to preserve my empathy because I am a psychiatrist. Incidental discovery, so no symptoms. And in this case, the cognitive assessment was really totally normal. And you can see in the right, so-called non-dominant hemisphere. So you have a paradox. It's the non-dominant, sorry, hemisphere, and everyone would like to operate under general anesthesia. On the other hand, it's an incidental discovery, and the patient told you, I have a normal life, and I would like to preserve my mentalistic abilities. So half of people would say, finally, we have to wait. So the solution is just in between. Please await the patient. Please identify the IFOF, the SLF. Please remove as much as you can beyond the flare and you obtain this kind of resection. In a patient still alive with more than 10 years of follow-up, of course, without chemo radiotherapy, while there was finally a micro focus, focus of magnetic transformation and without any cognitive and behavioral deficit because still able to continue to be a psychiatrist. So in fact, this dilemma is solved. Okay, great. Yeah, that's a great explanation. Uh, Matt, you want to uh, show your case? Uh, sure. And thanks again, Mike, for inviting me. And you, it's nice to hear your voice again. Let's see a few of our papers that we've collaborated on. Hopefully Does broken there exist in Chicago? <laughs> Not here either. Okay, so I have a, this is a, I'll try to go kind of quickly. I think we're a little bit behind time, but um, just a 30 year old right-handed female insurance analyst uh, who had basically had um, some headaches for a couple months and in a, in a quite severe headache. And so an MRI was ordered just as an outpatient. She, after that actually was, it was ordered. She was doing fine, in fact, asymptomatic. But uh, when the MRI was done, uh, which is kind of the how it works here in Chicago, showed something abnormal. So they're told to rush off to the emergency room to, to get this dealt with. 
Um, interestingly, she does have a family history of a glioblastoma um, on, the, on the father's side, malignant melanoma and prostate in her family. And her, her, her exam was grossly normal. She did have uh, on formal neuropsych testing. So that's what I brought back from Montpellier here. Um, uh, you know, if you just sit, sit there at the bedside as, as Dr. Defoe was dis discussing, and I think this is a, a, an important point, you know, everything was fine, but if you do this, she did have some executive dysfunction. And, and on one of three motor tests, some slight change in, uh, on the left finger tap. So this is the lesion. This is what we found. So she has kind of, um, I don't know how well the MRI shows up, but basically three foci, if you will. Two here, uh, one in the, in the uh, right uh, spirofrontal gyrus, and then a little bit of kind of fairly subtle here, SMA and uh, precentral gyrus up high, and then this left, uh, almost the frontal eye field area on the left side that's a little bit more expansile. And uh, things already I'll just get excited about, there was this T2 flare mismatch, um, which as you know, is, can be seen in astrocytomas versus solid but endogliomas. So that's what we saw. Um, pretty, pretty. Uh, so she was originally admitted to the neurology service, and given it's a young young woman with three foci, some of these actually not real convincing necessarily. If, if you would disregard sort of this left frontal lesion, um, you know, the, the differential could be pretty broad here. So I had a very extensive workup. I just put the. I won't go over this other than to say a fairly extensive and very expensive workup, um, and. And then we were, so basically nothing inflammatory infectious, CSF was negative, flow was negative, all of this. And we were asked basically to do a biopsy to determine what was going on. So I'll, I'll kick it to Dr. Defoe um, at this point. Um, what, what would your next steps be? Any further workup, any further imaging, serial imaging, biopsy, or just jump to surgery? If, if surgery, one, two, or three lesions. Definitely. I will do a second MRI in all cases, especially in this complex case. I mean, in order to see if there is a growth, a stabilization, or maybe uh, uh, an involution, uh, if uh, it could be something else. Uh, I mean, uh, multiple sclerosis, I don't know. Because I yeah. know that it will not be possible, at least in my hand, to remove the third lesion within right. the parasympathetic lobule, because this is the out output. So according to the demonstration of a growth of uh, at least one to two lesions anteriorly, then I would recommend to operate if there is a growth in uh, the left premotor area and uh, to do a supratotorization in uh, uh, the right frontal pool. But if these lesions are stable, then I would continue to follow them and if there was an increase, especially in the posterior part, in the Rolandic part, in the paracentral lobule, mm -hmm. I would prefer just a biopsy because surgery has a risk not to change radically the whole natural history of the three disease. So definitely, first of all, to demonstrate the growth rate or not, and to decide to do nothing or to do a biopsy or to operate according to the evolution or not of the three lesions. Yeah. Well, I think it's a very reasonable approach. We we did discuss that, and and um, the, both the primary team and the patient were were wanted you know, wanted a diagnosis, and we so we ended up basically biopsying the left frontal mass. I, I do very 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 few biopsies. Um, this may be the second one I've done in, since I've been attending, um, and it showed a WHO grade two IDH mutant astrocytoma with an F1 and bracket two deletions. So I guess let's uh, you know. We, we kind of had a discussion at our tumor board about what to do based on that. Now we have a diagnosis, at least in hand. Um, she was basically, you know, quite intact. Some, some very subtle things on neuropsych testing. So now we know what the diagnosis is. Um, and we discussed, you know, what do we do about that? So let's say uh, you, if you knew, now, now we know what this is for sure, presumably in three months or six months, if we watched, we would have figured that out, like you said, very reliably. Um, so we ended up deciding to, to remove at the same craniotomy or same sitting two one incision, two craniotomies, this, this lesion and this lesion and, and, and leave this alone. I wonder what else, what other folks might've done. And then the question, I think, um, what do we do after that? 
Uh, first of all, so the rehabilitation in order for the patient to totally recover because uh, uh, yeah. you see that three weeks uh, following surgery, yeah. she was not perfect, uh, which is Correct. normal. To return to a normal life, to continue to follow her and to demonstrate yeah. or not the growth uh, of the uh, third lesion, which is very likely. And at that time, I would recommend chemotherapy because you have a chance to stabilize the three lesions while if you do radiotherapy you will have to irradiate a so big volume regarding both hemispheres that of course the patient will be fine two to three years later but i would like to see her cognitive assessment five to ten years later yeah that's essentially what we did so we ended up just doing chemotherapy because we left an untreated lesion essentially that was our thought process so we just did temozolomide alone and it's a young patient very functional um so that that's what we ended up doing for her um do you it seems that uh you know very there's very little data out there on multifocal uh multicentric gliomas one is the paper we've we worked on together of course a long time ago um and i don't know i seem to see that quite a bit in my practice is, is that the is that common in other folks it's often something in the thalamus or fairly distant um maybe i don't know if it's just that we do more volumetric flare now and we're or we have more sensitivity with mri but I, it's not that uncommon for me relative to what's in the literature. I uh, managed uh, 20 patients with uh, real multicentric uh, low-grade glioma in my career. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the reason why I told you if you can demonstrate the, the progression, uh, it could be a good opportunity to remove the two anterior lesion because right. my message is that if you treat aggressively, not against, of course, the quality of life, but the survival is more or less the same. And uh, there is no coincidence, but today I had by phone a patient I operated on in this paper, so 20 years ago, with uh, two lesions, and I did four surgeries, and I can tell you that uh, she's enjoying perfect normal life. And finally, we are discussing now about radiotherapy 20 years after the first surgery. Oh, well. Just while I have the floor a bit, I had one one question that I think um, is a pretty common one I get asked by other um, tumor surgeons in particular. How do you decide when to reoperate in, for a patient with a low-grade glioma? You obviously there's some flare residual that'll grow, and is, is it a volume? Is it how much volume is there? Kind of based on Mitch's earlier data, is it the growth rate of that residual? Is it time? Do you just do it every four years, like uh, oil change, or what's your thought? process doing that? Many parameters, uh, most of them uh, uh, you cited. Uh, I mean, uh, first of all, of course, the growth rate. If uh -huh. a tumor is uh, 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 growing quickly following surgery, more or less, you know that you have to stop it and it's better to go to adjuvant treatment. Second, because if the tumor is growing faster, mechanisms of neuroplasticity will not be so efficient. It's uh, really uh, uh, correlated to the time course of the tumor. Third, the invasion. You did not mention the pattern of migration into the minimal common brain, so the connectivity, and I know that I will not be able to reoperate or I will do just more or less a, a partial resection versus uh, much more at the level of the cortex. Third, the volume. If the patient is really well, the tumor is growing uh, slowly and you can reoperate, so I will wait most of the time between uh, 10 to 15 uh, uh, cc because in the literature you can see from Mitch uh, in the low grade glioma uh, in France and uh, the European low grade glioma uh, recently in Germany and so on. It's very exceptional to see uh, a sudden malignant transformation of a tumor uh, uh, before reaching 10 to 15 cc if the growth rate uh, is uh, slow. And of course, the cognitive assessment of the patient, because if you see a decline of the cognitive assessment, that means that you have to treat earlier, while if the patient is perfect, that means that mechanisms of neuroplasticity are intact, and then you can postpone according to finally the wishes of the patient. So that means that these, these kind of parameters, I have a tendency to explain, as you know, since the first meeting, and then the patients finally apart also of uh, and their own decision uh, uh, through over years by telling uh, sometimes uh, 
Um, I came today uh, five years later while I feel well, but I'm sure that uh, you will propose me uh, to be rare priority done according to the growth rate. And I can tell you that I agree. And sometimes you have nothing to, uh, to say because uh, they understood by themselves. Oh, that's a great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We just have a few more minutes. Uh, maybe Sean, uh, can you fit in your, your presentation next? Uh, yeah. yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. It can be super fast. I think most of what I was going to bring up has been discussed, but let me, I do have one question. So let's share a screen here. Okay. Can you can you see this okay? Yes. Okay, so this is uh, just a 33-year-old right-handed male. He's a uh, software engineer um, and presents with seizures. Past medical history is largely um, not significant. I didn't put his full neuropsych assessment up here, but some mild executive dysfunction, multitasking problems in his work, um, but he's able to work full-time with this. and. Um, relatively normal processing speed. Uh, came in with this preoperative imaging. Um, I guess we've talked a bit about my initial questions, which were here, observation versus surgery, preoperative workup. We've talked about awake versus sleep. Um, I guess two last questions. One will be for you, transcortical versus transylvian approach. Any idea which one? Oh, you're muted, Professor Dufault. I will do a cognitive assessment, a second MRI to propose surgery, because of course it's a tumor and we know that the tumor will very quickly grow in order for the patient to think about what we spoke about this evening. Of course, I will propose a wake surgery because uh, uh, I will try to map the attentional processing, the behavioral processing, thanks to the mentalizing task, the dual task, so the meta networking brain, the IFOF, so the uh, nonverbal semantic processing in addition to language or past movement, blah, blah. You understood now. Mm -hmm. I will do a transcortical. Uh, uh, in this case, it's very easy to answer because there is an invasion also of uh, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, operculum. So that means that for me, it's not logical to go through the sylvian fissure because if you want to tend toward maximum resection, you will have to remove at least the orbitofrontal part. And in the orbitofrontal part, you have the termination of the IFOF, the SLF, and so on. And you understand why I would uh, prefer to do that uh, under awake uh, surgery. And uh, mm -hmm. processing uh, speed, uh, you mean into the operating theater for the patient doing yeah. task? Or? So, yeah, so what I mean by that is that here in the Bay Area, as you, know, you can imagine, a significant number of patients work uh, in software. They work in jobs where um, you know, multitasking and, pro and, and processing speed is a, just a big part of their work. And um, as software engineers, as engineers in general, and they can, and they're very, they can, they can perceive minor changes in processing speed um, after surgery, and it impacts how they how they can work effectively. Um, we ha have built a cog rehab program, really mirroring the work that you and Matt Tate and others have done. Uh, which has been very helpful um, for our patients. And we've developed a number of tasks to use in the operating room, basically from lear after learning from you. Um, but processing speed doesn't seem to rehab well, um, meaning these patients still have some issues with work. They're able to work, they're able to work full time, but it's different. Um, and I'm curious, you know, with your patients, especially these, you know, very high functioning software engineers where processing speed and multitasking is in creative problem solving is such a big part of the job. Have you developed any interoperative tasks or have any thoughts about cog rehab for individuals like this? Yes, because I was aware about that approximately 10 years ago. Uh, um, not so well known paper we published in Journal of Neuro Oncology. Uh, and I discovered, unfortunately, a posteriori, that uh, if the patient had uh, an increase of uh, the processing speed, uh, 
it was correlated to the possibility to return to work or not in agreement with uh, exactly what we explained. So that means that now I will ask her to a patient to do multitask into the OR, but as I said, every four seconds. That means that for me, tiredness into the OR is not because the patient is doing a task, it's because I'm changing the meta network equilibrium. And that means that the patient is not able to do two things simultaneously within four seconds is related to my surgical act. And so it will depend on the moral contract we had with the patient before surgery. If the patient told you, I want to live absolutely and don't want to be a fuzzy hemiplegic, I will push and finally more or less I don't care because the patient told me you can do that. But if the patient is a high level we like to return to a demanding work, needs uh, to make decisions online and so on. I know that uh, if I ask the patient in the end just to move or to speak or to do the semantic association task and so on, and to increase the reaction time by telling, okay, I can tolerate five seconds, it will not be aphasic hemiplegic, but I lie at that time to the patient because I know that he has a risk not to totally recover regarding the executive function. So that means that I know that some visitors uh, in my life uh, were a little bit horrified because I stopped the resection just because the patient was not able to continue to do two tasks in four seconds, according to what he decided before. And I said, we will do postoperative rehabilitation if we return to a normal life, and then I will reoperate a few years later. Thank you, it's very helpful. Okay, uh, Dr. McCon, uh, you want to summarize your last case here in, in the last one minute, and then we'll. Uh, I think we're. Uh, let me unmute you. Sorry, do you have do you have the slide there? Yeah, sure. I'll get it right now. One second. So, Hugh, this is a somewhat unusual case. So, just want to get your opinion quickly. Um, this woman is fifty-eight. She actually. Like a lot of uh, people involved in healthcare, she uh, she ignored her symptoms until she came in quite ataxic with resting tremor, left-sided sensory extinction, mild paresis, and she was having also secondary generalized seizures. Um, she's got, this is probably the only time I've ever seen this. She has a, an intraaxial glioma that's extending extraaxially into the posterior fossa and compressing the brainstem. Uh, a lot of mass effect, and uh, so the question is, A, would you operate on this patient awake? Uh, B, if you did in this particular anatomy, what would you uh, be looking for exactly to test? And then why don't, we, why don't we go to the next one in terms of the anatomy there? Yeah, and then advance through because there's one more on the right. Uh, and then also, what would your plan be about the posterior fossa component of this glioma? Would you try to do it all at one setting or would you stage the surgery? Um, obviously you can see there the posterior cerebral artery is running right through the middle of the tumor with all of its perforators going through the tumor. I think that uh, because the patient has uh, already so many difficulties, maybe because it happened sometimes, uh, of course, in my life, uh, I did the first surgery under general anesthesia just in order to debulk the tumor to decrease the volume and not to take any risk at the level of the anterior perforating substance uh, uh, above and not uh, uh, to remove immediately uh, uh, the posterior fossa. And then that means that after surgery, thanks to a decrease of the mass effect, you have a chance to see an improvement. Uh, I mean, uh, not to remove completely the posterior fossa, but of course uh, you can open uh, just a little bit the tantorium and to remove uh, uh, a part uh, without any risk uh, uh, by uh, decreasing the volume also and the mass effect at the level of the brainstem. And once the patient recovered, once again, multi-stage, then after rehabilitation, then, uh, and according to the um, um, your pathological examination, you can come back in order to awake the patient and to remove more because at that time you know that the patient will be able to help you and according to the wishes. So that means that sometimes I did 
general anesthesia, debulking, second surgery in a preventive way, if I can say, at least with 99% of control. Sometimes, if there was no uh, the invasion of the posterior fossa, and uh, um, maybe a uh, um, central part with a glioblastoma, what I did uh, is to debulk during the same time, then to wake the patient and to see that the patient improved throughout surgery thanks to the removal of the mass effect. And finally, to do these uh, two steps within the same part, same surgery, first part under general anesthesia, second part after decreasing of the mass effect under local anesthesia. And it was so impressive to see that the second part of surgery in glioblastoma with very big mass effect was like a low-grade glioma I presented today uh, during the uh, last uh, uh, 30 minutes. So you see that once again, I can really adapt according to the uh, cognitive assessment of the patient before surgery and of course is her ability to help me uh, knowing that sometimes they have no time to think about uh, uh, the motivation to be operated on awake and then I will do two stages. Have you, uh, have you seen a glioma go into the posterior fossa like this? Because I, 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 up until this case, I had not seen that before. No, it happened. This is the reason why I told you, yes, you can uh, open a little bit the tantorium and then uh, to remove exactly what you did, uh, uh, the upper part in order to decompress the brainstem. Yeah, but, so, that's, uh, so, so that's exactly what we did. I did the first stage of sleep. What I, what I found, though, is that once we'd worked between all the PCA branches, there were so many small little tiny perforators, so many of which were going deep you know, towards the brainstem and upwards off the PCA that I wasn't comfortable, even though we did, you know, you know, we, we, we cut the tent and sutured it upwards. And on the right, you can see that's as far down as I could get with still a lot of brainstem mass effect. So I felt like we had to go and get the posterior fossa part out before considering would we do more. So we did the second part with, with basically a, a retro sig posterior fossa approach when the next scan, the next last slide here, so on the left is immediately after surgery, what it looked like, and you can see how far in the tumor went towards the cerebellar peduncle. And then this is now six months later on the right. And the pathology here was quite similar to, uh, to the case that was shown earlier in terms of it being a predominantly grade two appearing IDH mutated uh, low grade glioma, but with foci of increased mitotic activity and atypia, cellular atypia. So it was actually signed out as a grade three by our pathologists. And interestingly, the posterior fossa part was more aggressive than the supertentorial part in terms of the pathology, so. This is not a good point because uh, with the posterior fossa more aggressive and with the impossibility to do a supratotalization at this level, uh, probably you will have to give adjuvant treatment in this case. Yeah, which, which is what we did and it's three years out and so far things are okay. Although she did end up developing because it was really a massively open ventricle, she developed external hydrocephalus and we had to put in a shunt. Okay. Uh, it's, it's way past uh, Dr. Defoe's bedtime, I think, <laughs> but uh, I really want to appreciate uh, and thank him for uh, his time with us tonight. Uh, there were some amazing points and, and great cases by the panelists. Thank you again for joining us here. Uh, again, the, the conference will be put on YouTube for those of you who missed part of it. You could always go there and normally gets uploaded on Friday night. Um, and otherwise, we'll see you here next week for uh, the next Brain Tumor Symposium or tomorrow night for our Skull-Based Vascular Symposium. Uh, thank you again uh, to everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Be safe. Goodbye. Thanks so much. Take care. Take care.